60-year-old Jean Tuggy lived in Pine Grove Mills, Pennsylvania in 2016. She worked at a Wegmans food market. On January 21st, Jean's body was found in her home. She had been shot twice with a 9mm pistol. It was clear that she did not take her own life. Nothing was taken from the home and no evidence was left behind. The initial investigation did not deliver any real leads that could help solve the case. Recently, investigators found out some information and they could make progress. They learned that Jean had developed a friendship with one of her co-workers, Christopher Kowalski. He became romantically interested in her. Investigators also learned that at the time her life was taken, he owned a 9mm pistol. He sold it and moved to South Carolina. Investigators located the owner of the pistol and after examination of the weapon, it was determined that the pistol was most likely the same one used to take Jean's life. Investigators then went to South Carolina to interview Kowalski. He immediately confessed and admitted he is responsible. He was then taken to Pennsylvania to be prosecuted. It had not been revealed yet why he did what he did. Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro had this to say. Thanks to the diligent efforts of the lawyers, investigators, and fellow members of law enforcement who never gave up on this case. The arrest of Christopher Kowalski is the first step toward putting him behind bars. The Tuggy family has waited too long for justice, but we hope this helps them heal. In the early morning hours of October 20, 1990, police in Mountain View, California responded to a fight. At the scene, they found 27-year-old Daryl O'Donnell suffering from a stab wound. He was immediately taken to the hospital but did not survive his injuries. Witnesses to the fight gave investigators a vague description of the suspect, but it did not lead to an arrest. At the crime scene, investigators found blood that did not belong to Daryl and most likely belonged to the man that fatally stabbed him. Recently, Sergeant Dave Fisher submitted that evidence to the county crime lab. A few weeks later, they had a name linked by DNA evidence. Officials at the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office reviewed the case and the analysis. In late January of 2021, they signed off on closing the case. They named Sunnyvale resident John Snowgrass as the official suspect. Unfortunately, there will not be any arrests made as John passed away in 2006. Daryl's sister, Lisa O'Donnell, thanked Mountain View Police in a statement. This brings a great sense of closure to me and my loved ones. It's just amazing to find out this news after so many years, and we are so thankful for answered prayers. Daryl had a God-given gift of entertaining and talking to people, she added. He had a great sense of humor and just loved making people laugh. He just loved life, and people loved being part of his life. Sergeant Dave Fisher, who had a very important part to play in the case being solved, now had this to say. It always feels like there is one more chance, one more opportunity, to try and solve a case. This is what we work towards every day in this unit. It is always a small comfort to be able to go and tell a family, finally. 20-year-old Catherine Janeiro lived in Barrie, Ontario, Canada in 1994. She had a two-year-old daughter named Dawn. On October 10, Dawn was staying with her grandparents, Dinora and Fernando Janeiro, in Toronto. Catherine was home alone. During the day, Catherine's friend knocked on the door. When they did not receive any answer, they made their way inside. In the basement of her home, her friends made a startling discovery. They found her lifeless body. She had been stabbed numerous times. Barry police began the investigation, but turned the case over to the Ontario Provincial Police in 1999. After an extensive investigation that did not lead to any arrest, the Ontario Provincial Police then turned the case back over to the Barry Police in 2012. Investigators said they collected hundreds of pieces of evidence and took hundreds of witness statements as part of the investigation over the years. It is important that every piece of information received is always closely examined. You never know which one holds the key detail you are searching for and will lead your team ultimately to the arrest of the person responsible, said case manager Detective Kevin Scales. In 2014, investigators announced that they had two men under surveillance who they believed had a connection to Catherine's case. Catherine's daughter Dawn also spoke at the press conference. She told the media how she first learned that her mother's life was taken. When I was six years old and my grandparents were distracted, I was flipping through channels and came across the Crime Stoppers episode. The episode was a reenactment of a young woman being stabbed in her apartment. As young as I was, I still remember being terrified and sad for this woman and sad for her family. Moments later, a picture of the real victim holding her child was put on the screen 
and I realized at that moment that was my mother. I knew because it was the same picture that's in my living room to this day. I've never been able to get rid of the hurt and confusion that flooded my mind that night. Seven years later, in January of 2021, detectives arrested 58-year-old Robert Bruce McQueen in connection to the case. Peter Leon, Barry Police spokesperson, said, He was arrested yesterday morning without incident, operating a motor vehicle in the south end of the city of Barry. I think he was surprised, as you can appreciate, 26 years had passed. That's a lot of looking over your shoulder, wondering if today is the day. Well, yesterday was the day, Leon said of the arrest. Don said that the arrest had brought her closure. I wish my grandparents, Dinora and Fernando Janeiro, were alive to see this day. It has been revealed that Catherine and Robert knew each other, but the police did not elaborate further. They also didn't give a lot of information as to what led to the arrest of Robert, just that the arrest came following a tip they received in 2019. On January 21st, Robert made a brief appearance in a Barry courtroom. He also faces charges of driving while disqualified in August 2020. Not much is known about Robert, just that he lived in Barrie most of his life, worked in construction and other odd jobs, and was crazy over shows like CSI and Law & Order. Investigators are also looking into the possibility that Robert was involved in other crimes. 31-year-old Claritha Gibbs lived in Fort Myers, Florida in 1984. She originally lived in Tampa, but moved to Fort Myers in 1979. Claritha fell on hard times and started working as a prostitute. At her work, she went by the name Coco. On June 26, 1984, Fort Myers police responded to a call of shots being fired in the area of Palm Beach Avenue and Lincoln Boulevard. They found Claritha's body at 2831 Lincoln Boulevard. She had been fatally shot. At the crime scene, they found a rag with the suspect's DNA, but at the time, DNA testing was not common or very advanced. Witnesses came forward and told police that they last saw Claritha entering a two-tone vehicle, possibly a pickup, just before hearing a gunshot. The driver was described as a white male in his 30s, with brown or dark blonde hair, a thin build, approximately 5 foot 10 inches tall with a pale complexion. Despite the detailed description of the suspect, investigators were not able to identify him. The case was revisited in a special report in September 1994 edition of The News Press about the 16 unsolved cases of prostitutes whose lives were taken in the Fort Myers area in the preceding 20 years. In January 2017, Fort Myers Police Department's Cold Case Unit investigators submitted the DNA evidence they had of the suspect from the RAG to DNA Labs International for more testing. A full DNA profile of the suspect was obtained and entered into CODIS the FBI's national DNA database, but it did not provide a hit to any known samples. In March of 2019, investigators contacted Parabon Nanolabs, asking for help in solving the case. Parabon then employed one of their services called Parabon Snapshot for development of a profile using genealogy research. Finally, on June 22, 2020, Parabon Nanolabs completed their report on the case. It indicated that the DNA profile was linked through genealogy databases to an individual identified as 65-year-old James Glenn Drennan. He lived in Okeechobee, Florida. Investigators then began to research James and found that he lived in Lee County, Florida at the time of the crime. Fort Myers is in Lee County. Investigators had to make sure that he is the one that took Claritha's life. So on July 27, 2020, investigators combed James's discarded trash and obtained a sample of his DNA. The sample was then sent to DNA Labs International. It was a match for the DNA collected from the scene on the night Claritha's life was taken. On January 13, 2021, investigators contacted James in Okeechobee, Florida. James then provided a statement where he admitted that he fatally shot Claritha. James said that he was working as an area mechanic and picked up Claritha to engage in her services. James claimed that she pulled a gun on him to rob him. They fought over the weapon and Claritha was shot during the altercation. According to James, he then fled the scene and threw the gun out the window of his truck. Five days after confessing, on January 18, 2021, James passed away in his home. There's been no more information made public as to how he passed. His confession was enough for Fort Myers police to close the case. 
We'll never know what truly happened though on that fateful day. One of Claritha's surviving relatives, a sister named Cynthia Hampton, who lives in Cape Coral, Florida, was surprised when the police contacted her about the investigation. She said that it feels good to know now who took Claritha's life. The Fort Myers Police Department have issued a statement saying, the case is an excellent example of good old-fashioned police work, combined with the advancements that technology can provide law enforcement. The Fort Myers Police Department and Chief Derek Diggs are committed to using any resource or technology available to solve our unsolved cases and bring justice to their families. Seventy-eight-year-old Mildred Manthony lived in Lake Worth, Florida in 1985. She suffered from dementia. Mildred was a retired nurse. On the evening of April 27th, a passerby discovered Mildred with life-threatening injuries. She was naked and bloody from blows to her head and face. Her discarded clothes were strewn around and her dentures were found in the dirt. She was then taken to the hospital, but sadly succumbed to her injuries a few days later. Investigators tried to create a timeline. They found that Mildred was last seen at her home, where she lived with her younger sister Gladys Nolan, in the 1300 block of Crestwood Boulevard in Lake Worth Beach. Mildred then seemingly wandered off, not for the first time. At 4.30 p.m., she was reported missing. Then at 10 p.m., she was found by the passerby lying on the ground in Old Town Indian Road in Jupiter, more than 30 miles from her home. Witnesses reported seeing Mildred get into a brown Oldsmobile sedan at the intersection of Dixie Highway and Lucerne Avenue. The witnesses told investigators that the man behind the wheel said he was Mildred's neighbor and was going to help her get home. What exactly happened between then and when she was found, they did not know. An autopsy revealed that she had been indecently assaulted. Frustratingly, without suspects or strong leads, the case went cold for many years. That was until recently. Investigators took the DNA of the suspect they collected from Mildred's body in 1985 and made use of genetic genealogy to identify him. In March of 2021, they identified him as 61-year-old Richard Curtis Lang. He lives in Boynton Beach, Florida, which is very close to where Mildred lived. He is currently being held at Palm Beach County Jail without bond. He denies any involvement in the crime and hired a defense attorney. The attorney had this to say in a statement. Mr. Lang vehemently denies the allegations brought today by the Palm Beach County State's Attorney Office, and we look forward to aggressively challenging the forensic evidence attributed to Mr. Lang. Nothing in Mr. Lang's past indicates a propensity for such abhorrent behavior, and given his age and health, we will argue that he should be released to home detention as we prepare for trial. It is unclear how Mildred's path may have crossed with Richard, who was 25 years old at the time the crime occurred. Richard is a convicted felon. His DNA was uploaded to CODIS after his arrest on a weapons possession charge in 2012 in Palm Beach County. Despite him denying any involvement, investigators are sure that he is responsible. He is a convicted felon, lived in the area, and it's really hard explaining away the fact that his DNA was found inside her body. Mildred's son had this to say following the arrest. It's been a long time, and I'm thankful to the cold case people for finding that dastardly SOB. He said his mom worked with psychiatric patients in a Little Rock hospital in Arkansas. She enjoyed sewing, cooking, and the company of family. Mary Prier and her husband Leonard lived in Flint, Michigan. They owned Sweet Marie's Candy Store for many years before selling it. They then moved to Lennon, Michigan to retire. In 1990, Leonard passed away. In the years since his passing, Mary became a fixture in the small village. She was a devout Catholic and often attended church functions. Lennon residents remember seeing her walk from home to the town diner for lunch and dinner most days. On February 27, 1997, Michigan State Police canine teams, taking part in training in the area, found 88-year-old Mary's body in a wooded area near her residence. She had been beaten, strangled, and indecently assaulted. It was a crime that shocked the small Lennon community. Investigators collected DNA at the crime scene that belonged to the suspect. They also conducted hundreds of interviews to gain evidence in the case and followed up on dozens of leads. Quickly, they zeroed in on Michael Burr. He lived in a residence a short walk from Mary's house. Investigators took his DNA sample so that it could be stored. 
as DNA was not advanced enough at the time to confirm that his matched what was found at the crime scene. Unfortunately, investigators could not gather enough evidence to meet the probable cause standard necessary to charge him in the connection to the case. Recently, the Genesee County Police Department partnered up with Michigan State Police Crime Lab to finally help solve the case. In November of 2021, they were able to match the DNA found at the scene to that of Michael Burr. Genesee County Prosecutor David Layton said, The DNA evidence shows a 1 in 1.9 octillion chance that Michael was not responsible for what happened to Mary. Ultimately, what we all want here is closure for the victim's families, he said. We want closure because when you lose a loved one in such a brutal manner, it never goes away from your mind. You never have a peaceful day when you can't stop thinking about it. Michael is currently being held in Genesee County Jail without bond. He is now scheduled for a probable cause hearing in Genesee County District Court on November 24, 2021, when prosecutors will lay out the evidence against him. Seventeen-year-old Patricia Moreno lived in Malden, Massachusetts in 1991. She lived with her foster family in an apartment on Henry Street. This included her foster mother, the mother's two teenage daughters, and a boyfriend of one of the daughters, Rodney Daniels. At 3 a.m. on June 20, 1991, police responded to a call from the apartment where Patricia lived. There, they found her face down on the fire escape with a single gunshot wound to the head. She was still breathing, but seriously injured. Patricia was then rushed to the hospital, but sadly succumbed to her injuries. Patricia's foster family and Rodney were all in the apartment at the time that Patricia got shot. Each of them claimed that they heard the shots, but did not see who the shooter was. Rodney claimed that he was asleep in an armchair in the living room when he was awakened by the sound of the shots. He then apparently walked to the fire escape and saw Patricia. The foster mother called the police after that. Investigators learned that Rodney possessed multiple handguns close to the time and had engaged in threatening behavior toward Patricia in the weeks before her life was taken. While many people were interviewed and leads were followed, no arrests were made and the case went cold. In 2020, the Middlesex County's DA's cold case unit reconstructed Patricia's position on the fire escape. The DA's office then wrote this in a statement. Based on the position of the entry wound and the downward trajectory of the bullet, the path of the bullet was consistent with having been fired by an individual standing in the area of the doorway to the apartment where the victim had resided with her foster family and where Rodney had been staying that evening. Investigators then began re-interviewing witnesses and located a witness who had been out of the country for a while. That witness lived in the apartment just below Patricia's on the second floor. They said they'd been woken by a loud noise and immediately looked to the fire escape. They provided a description of the person they had seen there which was consistent with Rodney's appearance. They also said the man immediately retreated into the apartment and closed the door. With the new information, investigators went ahead and obtained a warrant from Molden District Court. With the help of South Fulton Police in Georgia, they arrested Rodney at his home in late September of 2021. He was arraigned in Georgia as a fugitive from justice and is being transported back to Massachusetts. Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan had this to say, after three decades, we have taken the first steps today to hold accountable the person we allege took Patricia's life. It is always with mixed emotions that we make these announcements, as we know this will not fill the void caused by the loss of a daughter, a sister, and a friend to many. I do hope, however, that it brings hope to some of the families who are still awaiting answers. This is a case that was solved not by new development in forensic science, but as a result of relentless investigative work and a change in circumstances for some parties involved. We will never give up on a case. This case is emblematic of that. We know, whenever we make these announcements, it's bittersweet. On one hand, we are finally able to hold someone accountable. On the other hand, it certainly brings back a well of memories, takes people back to probably what was one of the worst incidents in their lives. Investigators are now looking into the possibility that Patricia's foster family knew that Rodney took her life, but protected him for all these years. Not much is known about the next case. 48-year-old Jose Rafael Laro lived in Brooklyn, New York in 1993. On August 17th, he had an argument with an unknown man. The man then fatally shot Jose. Thanks to witnesses, the man was identified as 20-year-old Luis Carmona. 
Lewis fled to the Dominican Republic before he could be arrested. Recently, members of the New York Police Department were able to track down Lewis's location. With the help of the local government and the FBI, Lewis was arrested. He was then extradited to New York in February 2021. It has not yet been made public why the two men were arguing that fateful day. 36-year-old Michael Glover lived in Macon, Georgia in 2004. He was a pastor and was well known in the community. On March 29th, he was fatally shot in the carport of his West Macon home. People in the community were shocked as he was so beloved. Investigators collected DNA from the suspect at the crime and stored it to be used later. For Michael's family, it was a long wait. His father, Willie Glover, described Michael as special and unique and would give the shirt off his back to help anyone. We were a close-knit family. We got together and he was missing. Finally, in 2021, his family would receive some good news. In March of 2021, 39-year-old Terrence Dean of Macon was arrested. It was discovered that his DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene back in 2004, as well as DNA found on an assault case. Investigator Malcolm Bryant with the Bibb County Sheriff's Office had this to say. The investigators that started the case, they did a good job in regards to including the small details which was very important. Taking that into consideration, I felt that there was a great chance that this case would lead to an arrest. Technology is nowhere near where it was back in 2004, which is a great thing for us. I think that is the direction that law enforcement is taking in general, towards the technology area. He believes they will be able to solve many more cases in the near future. Terrence Dean is currently being held without bond at this time. The motive has not been made public. Faith Hedgenpeth was born on September 26, 1992 in Warren County, North Carolina. She is a member of the Holly Wasaponi Native American tribe. In high school, Faith was an honor student, a cheerleader, and a member of many extracurricular clubs and organizations. She did so well that she earned the Gates Millennium Scholarship to attend University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. By 2012, she was an undergraduate student in her third year at the university. Faith lived in an off-campus apartment with her friend Karina Rosario and Karina's boyfriend, Eric Takoy Jones. The relationship between Karina and Eric soured and he had to move out. He abused Karina and when he tried to break into the apartment, Faith and Karina went to court to get a protective order that required Eric to stay away from them. Eric really hated Faith because he believed she is the reason that his relationship with Karina did not work out. At one point, he called Faith and threatened to take her life. Just after midnight on September 7, 2012, Faith and Karina left their apartment to go to a nightclub in downtown Chapel Hill called The Thrill. Just after 2 a.m., the pair left the club and headed home. This is the last time Faith would be seen alive. By 3 a.m., Faith and Karina had returned to their apartment. A woman living below them was awake and watching TV and said she heard thumping noises. She described it as being similar to a heavy bag being dropped or furniture being overturned. Around this time, Faith's Facebook account was accessed. At 3.40 a.m., a text was sent from Faith's phone to that of Brandon Edwards, a former boyfriend of hers. She asked him to come over, but he did not respond. Karina's phone records showed that she was also trying to call Brandon around the same time. When Brandon did not answer, Karina called a fellow University of North Carolina Chapel Hill student, Jordan McRae. At 4.25 a.m., she left the apartment to get in Jordan's car. She left the apartment door unlocked. Six hours later, at 10.30 a.m., Karina tried to call Faith, but she did not get an answer. Karina then called another friend, Marisol Rangel, who gave her a ride back to Faith in Karina's apartment. At the apartment in Faith's bedroom, Karina and Marisol made a startling discovery. They found Faith's body wrapped in a quilt. She had been beaten. They then called 911 to inform the police. Dara 911, where is your emergency? Hi, um, I just walked into my apartment and my friend just waited to be unconscious. Okay, what's your address, ma'am? I live at Hope at the view. Um, give me give me the address. I just I just moved here, I'm about to get it. Oh my god. 
It's um five six three nine Old Chapel Hill Road in Durham. Okay, repeat it to me. It. So, repeat it to me so I make sure I've got it correct. Okay. Five six three nine Old Chapel Hill Road. It's a plan. Okay, what's it? Sixteen oh two. Sixteen oh two. Yes. Okay. What's the phone number you're calling from? Two zero one three two one eight zero seven five. Okay, you say your friend is unconscious? He's unconscious. I just walked in the apartment and there looks like there's blood in Okay, listen to me. Okay, listen to me. Listen to me. Somebody's already yes. sending me ambulance. Okay? I need to get some information from you and I'm gonna I'm gonna help I'm gonna tell you how to help her, okay? Okay. Okay. How how old is your How old is she? She's nineteen. Okay. I don't know. I don't okay. want to touch her, but listen to me. Is is she breathing? I don't know. You need to check and see. Is she breathing? Hey, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, listen to me. There's blood everywhere. There's what? There's blood everywhere. Okay. I don't know what happened. Okay, is she on her back or is she on her laying on her stomach? She's on, she's on her back, but like she, I think she fell off the bed because she's like off the bed. There's blood all over the pillows, like in the comforter. I just don't know what happened. Okay. All right, listen to me, all right? Is someone coming? Yes, I've got somebody coming. I've got somebody coming. I need for you to help her. I need for you to go up to her. We need to see if she's breathing or not. Okay? I think so. Okay. Listen to me. Go up. The paramedics are on their way. I want you to stay on the line. I'm going to tell you what to do next, all right? Are you right by her now? Yes. Okay. Listen carefully. Listen. She's not moving. Okay. No. Will you touch her arm? Tell me, does she, how does she feel? She's not moving. Okay, ma'am. We need to find out if we can help her or not. You've got to, you know, do as I'm asking so we can help her. All right? Okay. Okay. If you can, lay her flat on her back. Remove any pillows. Lay her flat on her back. Flat on her back. Remove any pillows. Okay. Okay. Kneel next to her. Look in her mouth for food or vomit. Blood everywhere. Okay, kneel next to her and look in her mouth for She's food or vomit. So Tell me something. Sorry. Listen to me. Listen to What is your name? I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's okay, honey. It's okay, honey. Everywhere. Listen to me. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Listen to me. When you touch her, how does she feel? Does she feel what? warm? No, she feels cold. She feels cold? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Don't touch anything else, okay? Don't touch anything else. Okay. They're on their way. I've got police on the way to you, and I've got a, got medics on the way. Okay? Okay. What room is she in? She's in my bedroom. Okay. I want you to go back into the living room, okay? You I need don't to go know in. what's going on. Like, okay, listen, there's listen to in me. in my room that, like, was not here before. Okay, it listen like to someone me. someone had came in here. Okay, okay. It really does. All right, what, what did like you say your name was again? Here because okay, I don't... Understand. Okay, listen to me. Do, don't touch anything else in the room. I'm not I want touching. you to leave, leave that room and go into the living room. You I need did. to make sure make sure the door is unlocked so somebody can get in, so that the medics and the police can get in when they get there. Okay? Yeah, it's unlocked. Okay, they now tell me again. Get here, though. Okay, they're on their way, honey. They're coming as fast yeah. as they can. You just stay on the phone with me, all right? 
Tell, okay, tell me again what your name is. It looks like someone had been in there because she's okay. not like the cell. I don't know what Okay, okay. Is. I've let them know. We've got everybody on the way to help you. Now, tell me again what your name is. What? What is your name? Karina Rosario. Karina? Yes. Okay, Karina. You just you yes. sit down on the couch and don't touch anything, okay? You just sit down. I'm not touching anything. Okay, okay. I just want you to sit down because the the police and the medics are going to be there. Just They're coming just okay. as fast as they can, all right? Okay. You just you just stay on the phone with me. Okay. okay. You just stay on the phone with me. Are you sure there's something? Yes, ma'am. They are on their way. I can't believe this. No, someone had to have been in there. Okay. We've got we've got first responders on the way. There's a fire truck coming. There's a medic coming, and the sheriff's department's on the way to you. Okay. okay. You just stay on the phone with me until somebody gets there with you. All right? Okay. Okay, Karina. How old are you, Karina? I'm 20. You're 20? Okay, hon. You're doing all right. You're doing all right. You just stay on the I phone. I see with the me. police. You see the police? Yes. Okay. You let me know when they get in there with you, and then you can talk to them. All okay. right. I just don't want you to be alone right now. Okay. Okay. You just stay on the phone with me. Okay. Are they in there with you? Are they coming in? Yes. Thank you. Okay, honey. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. An autopsy revealed that Faith suffered blunt force trauma to the head. She was just 19 years old. At the crime scene, investigators were able to collect male DNA and use it to develop a DNA profile. Karina's ex-boyfriend and Faith's ex-roommate, Eric Jones, soon became a very strong suspect. Investigators learned of his history of domestic violence and his threats against Faith. It was also revealed that just before the crime, he sent a text to an acquaintance asking for forgiveness for what I am about to do. After the crime, he changed the banner on his Facebook page to read, Dear Lord, forgive me for all my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me. Investigators requested a DNA sample from Eric. After some resistance, he complied. Shockingly, his DNA did not match the sample from the apartment, and he was ruled out a suspect. Among the evidence at the crime scene was a note written in ballpoint pen on a white paper bag. It is believed that the person who took Faith's life wrote the note. A friend of Faith shared with police a long conversation when Faith pocket dialed the friend on the night she lost her life. In 2016, Parabon Nanolabs created an image of what the suspect looked like using his DNA. Based on his DNA, Parabon was also able to say that most of his genetic markers indicated that he has Mexican, Colombian, and Iberian ancestry. On September 16, 2021, the Chapel Hill Police Department arrested 28-year-old Miguel Seguero Oliveras in connection to the case. He lives in Durham, North Carolina, close to where Faith lived. In August of 2021, Miguel had been arrested for drunk driving in Wake County. His DNA was taken, and it was then that the investigators noticed that his DNA matched the male DNA sample found at the crime scene back in 2012. During the police press conference, Faith's mother Connie Hedgenbath said she cried tears of joy after learning about the arrest. When I got the news this morning, I didn't do anything but cry and thank God and praise God because I put it in his hands and it was his timing. I don't know why it took so long, but I just know that it was him. Miguel is currently being held without bond at Durham County Detention Center. Investigators have not released a lot of information about him yet. We do not know if he and Faith knew each other. Faith was just 19 years old. She would have been the first one in her family to graduate from college. She had aspirations to be a teacher or a pediatrician so that she could help others. But sadly, she never got to achieve those dreams. Maureen Brubaker Farley was born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa. 
In 1971, when she was 17 years old, she moved to Cedar Rapids. Maureen wanted to be closer to her husband David, who was serving time in Anamosa State Penitentiary. She quickly found work at a diner in town. On September 17, 1971, Maureen was last seen buying a pack of cigarettes. Later that day, she failed to pick up her check from work. Then, on September 20th, when Maureen failed to show up at work, her employer reported her as missing. Four days later, on September 24th, her body was found by two teenage boys in a wooded ravine near a landfill. Her body was on top of a trunk of an abandoned junk car. The two boys at first believed it was a woman sleeping, so they continued down the road to hunt. Upon returning to the abandoned car, they decided to take a closer look. It was then that they noticed the discoloration in her body. They ran back home to inform the police of what they had stumbled upon. An autopsy revealed she passed away from a skull fracture after being hit on the head. Investigators noted that there were clear signs that she had been carried and placed here at the crime scene after her life was taken elsewhere. At the crime scene, investigators were also able to collect DNA evidence belonging to the suspect. Six months after her body was found, Marine's mother wrote a letter to the Grand Rapids police saying that George Smith was responsible. George worked at the same diner where Marine worked. He also worked at a liquor store near her apartment. Police interviewed him, but did not have the evidence to charge him, or anyone else for that matter, so the case went cold. Recently, in 2021, the Cedar Rapids Police Department cold case unit took another look at the case. They took the DNA found at the crime scene that belonged to the suspect and created a DNA profile. They then tested it to see if it matched the DNA of George Smith, and it did. The only problem was that jackass passed away in 2013 at the age of 94. Maureen's younger sister Lisa said that she felt a lot of emotions including relief and closure. She also said that she and her family are satisfied with the evidence. Whenever anybody would pass from this world, my mom said, well, now they're up in heaven with Maureen and they must be happy and they know the answers. I just didn't want to wait that long. I didn't want us to wait until we go to the next world. I wanted answers in this world. Police Chief Wayne Germain had this to say in a statement. No matter how much time has passed, our officers are committed to seeking out justice for all victims of violent crime, as well as their families. I am extremely proud of the generations of Cedar Rapids officers that contributed to bringing this once cold case to a resolution. Marine's mother Mary, now 86, revealed why she told the investigators back in 1971 that it was George Smith. He apparently asked investigators constantly about updates in the case. His work at the liquor store would also see him making a lot of trips to that landfill as part of a hauling service. Mary also had this to say about the fact that he can't be prosecuted. We just figure he'll suffer in hell for it. What's done is done, and at least we know it was him, and we can quit wondering. We can let it go. In 1986, a sanitation worker in Greenwich, Connecticut found the body of a newborn baby boy in his truck when he emptied a dumpster. An autopsy showed that the baby had been strangled and that he was less than a day old. Investigators interviewed people who lived close to the dumpster trying to find out who the parents are, but couldn't gather any useful information. DNA was just coming out of a very early science in 1986, so it was not advanced enough to find relatives of the baby at the time. In 2019, investigators from Greenwich Police Department took the DNA sample that they had from the baby and made use of genetic genealogy to find his family members. Using this method, they discovered a person who they believed was the mother of the baby. Investigators traveled to a house in Lake Mary, Florida, where they believe the woman now lives. They collected garbage and recycling left in the bin in front of the house. From these items, they got a DNA match. They showed that the woman is indeed the mother of the baby. The woman is 62-year-old Janita Phillips. Investigators decided to interview her. She then confessed. Janita said that she kept the pregnancy a secret to everyone. She gave birth to a baby boy in her apartment, strangled him, and then left him in a bag in the dumpster outside the building in Greenwich, Connecticut. Court documents show that back in 1986, Janita was interviewed, but then she denied any knowledge of what had happened and refused to take a blood test. In Janita's statement to the police, she wrote that she knew her husband did not want any more kids and had big dreams of becoming a fashion designer. 
I didn't want to crash his dreams and fall down the rabbit hole of having a bunch of kids and stuck with bills and not being able to care for them, or get to achieve his dreams, reads the statement in part. DNA has also confirmed that Janita's husband is the father of the baby boy. According to her, he had no knowledge of what she did. Attorney Lindy Urso is representing Janita and says her client is devastated about that time of her life. She's overcome whatever happened here, and she lived a stellar life, never been arrested. This is her first time ever being arrested. She's raised a family, been married for all this time. She's been working steadily for 30 years in the same industry, Urso said. It seems like Lindy Urso does not have a problem with what Janita did. I find it quite ironic that Janita was caught because of her DNA that she left in the trash matched the DNA of the baby boy she also left in the trash. Nine-year-old Candace Rogers lived in Spokane, Washington in 1959. Her friends and family called her Candy. Candy was a member of the Campfire Girls, a youth group focused on outdoor activities. On March 6, 1959, she came home from school, played with her dog, ate a cookie, and then set out to sell campfire mints in her neighborhood. When Candy did not return by nightfall, her grandfather, mother, friends, and neighbors started to look for her. Over the next few days, thousands of people started searching for her. This included Marines, airmen, and military aircraft. Sadly, an Air Force helicopter involved in the search crashed and the three crew members passed away. On March 21, 1959, 15 days after Candy was last seen, two off-duty airmen hunting in the woods about seven miles from her home noticed a pair of children's shoes. The two men informed the police about their finding. The next morning, when that area was searched, Candy's body was found. She had been indecently assaulted and strangled with a piece of her own clothing. It was a crime that rocked Spokane. Hundreds of tips came in, but investigators were unable to identify the person that took Candy's life. All they had was DNA of the suspect found at the crime scene. Sergeant Zach Stormont of the Spokane Police Department described the case in the following way. I keep saying it's the Mount Everest of our cold cases, the one that we could never seem to overcome, but at the same time, nobody ever forgot. Recently, with advances in DNA technology, investigators were able to create a DNA profile from the evidence found at the crime scene back in 1959. They then made use of genetic genealogy and found a relative of the suspect. Investigators then interviewed the relative and took their DNA sample. Finally, in 2021, investigators revealed that they believe John Ray Hoff is the man who took Cindy's life. John grew up in Spokane and had a record of petty juvenile crime. When he was 17, he joined the army and served in Korea. In 1959, when Candy's life was taken, he was 20 years old and lived about a mile from her home. In 1961, he was convicted of grabbing a woman and tying her up before strangling her. The woman survived and John served six months in jail. As a result of the conviction, he was discharged from the army. John then sold cutlery and worked in a lumber yard. He also married and had children. In 1970, at the age of 31, he took his own life. To make sure that John is responsible for the crime, investigators exhumed his remains. He was buried in the same cemetery as Candy. After some more DNA testing, it was confirmed that John is responsible in November of 2021. Investigators are not sure if John knew Candy, but they did find one connection. John's stepsister was also a campfire girl who served as Candy's big sister in the program. While the identification brought some relief to Candy's surviving relatives, it was agonizing for Sergeant Stormont to have to tell John's widow and four children that he is responsible for such a heinous crime. John's daughter Kathy, whose DNA was used to link her father to the crime, said that she felt disbelief, anger, and sadness to learn that her father had been identified as the suspect. She was nine when he took his own life. It's just really sad to find out that someone not even just your dad, but just someone in your family could do something like that. I'm very, very sorry for what my dad did, that he took her life horribly. I hope that it gives her peace knowing that, even though it's not really justice because he doesn't get any punishment, but that his name has that on it now and they can know it's solved. 32-year-old Janet Love lived in Bedford, Texas in 1986. She grew up in a big family in Louisiana, 
but made her way to Texas when she found work as a ticket agent for Delta Airlines. On April 23, 1986, Janet was working the 3 p.m. to midnight shift at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Thereafter, she went home to her apartment in Bedford. The next day, on April 24th, she did not show up for work. Two of her co-workers who were concerned made their way inside of her apartment to check up on her. Inside of her apartment, they found Janet's body. She had been indecently assaulted and shot. Investigators collected DNA evidence from her body that belonged to the suspect. They also interviewed a lot of people, but did not gather any useful leads. Recently, the DNA was used to create a DNA profile. It was then submitted to the combined DNA index system, but no matches could be made. Investigators then decided to send the DNA to the University of North Texas in Denton County, where the school's Center for Human Identification made use of genetic genealogy to identify the suspect. Finally, in September of 2021, they identified him as Ray Anthony Chapa. They also linked him to various other crimes. Investigators learned that he lived in a neighboring apartment complex less than a thousand feet away from Janet. But as far as they could tell, Ray and Janet did not know each other before he took her life. Investigators are unable to arrest him as he passed away in January of 2021 from a terminal illness, but they are 100% sure that he would have been convicted if still alive. Janet's younger sister, Rebecca Roberts, had this to say, It's probably best that he is not alive and that our family doesn't have to go through a trial and all of the roller coaster of emotions that would come with that. None of it's going to bring her back but it is some sense of justice. Please say that Ray also lived in Montana and Chicago. It is very possible that he is involved in even more crimes. If you have any additional information, please call the Bedford Police Department at this number. Sixty-eight-year-old Robert Wong lived in Memphis, Tennessee in 2017. He was a retired military man, having worked as an Air National Guardsman. He had been diagnosed with cancer and was receiving treatment. On November 23, 2017, Robert was looking forward to spending Thanksgiving Day with his family, but he wasn't feeling well. His family then went out to an Asian restaurant for their Thanksgiving meal while he stayed at home. When his family returned home, they saw that his blue Honda Odyssey minivan was gone, which was odd because his illness stopped him from driving. His family then found Robert's body on the ground. He had been fatally shot. Because of his stolen vehicle, investigators believe that it was a robbery that went wrong. The vehicle was found the next day a few miles from his home, but there were no clues leading to a suspect. The case went cold until recently. New evidence and witness interviews led detectives to 19-year-old Dallas Perkins. He is currently serving a non-related seven-year prison sentence for aggravated robbery. Dallas was just 15 years old when he took Robert's life. In November of 2021, he was arrested and charged in connection to the case. He is charged as a juvenile and is now awaiting trial. 16-year-old Kim Bryant lived in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1979. She attended Western High School. January 26, 1979 started out normal for Kim as she went to school. Thereafter, she went to a Dairy Queen restaurant near North Decatur Boulevard in US Highway 95. Later in the day, when she did not arrive back home, her family got worried and called the police. An extensive search for Kim was then launched. Almost a month later, on February 20th, 1979, Kim's body was found in the desert. She had been indecently assaulted. Investigators collected DNA evidence belonging to the suspect from her body, but were unable to make an identification. Over the years, a number of detectives worked the case, but weren't able to solve it until recently. A private donation was given to the investigators that allowed them to send the DNA sample of the suspect to Ortham Incorporated and pay for DNA testing. Ortham is a Texas-based laboratory. They conducted genealogical research on the sample. Their testing led to a relative of the suspect who agreed to give a second sample. In late November of 2021, investigators announced that they had identified Johnny Blake Peterson as the person responsible for taking Kim's life. At the time of the crime, Johnny was 19 years old. He previously attended the same high school as Kim. Johnny passed away in 1993. He was never considered a suspect until it was discovered that his DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene back in 1979. Lieutenant Ray Spencer said during the press conference, 10 days ago, 
we were notified that the genealogical profile built by Ortham Labs based on the DNA recovered from the body of Kim Bryant at autopsy revealed that Johnny Blake Peterson is responsible. Ray Spencer also read a statement from Kim's father, Edward Elliott, in which he thanked the investigators for never giving up on the case. Kim was a beautiful girl with a bright future, and it makes me happy that something is being done to help solve cases such as hers. Kimberly Murga, Director of Laboratory Services for the Las Vegas Police said this, We first attempted DNA on this particular case back in 2008. We were not able to get a DNA profile. Technology has continued to advance and revolutionize. We again attempted DNA on different items of evidence in January of this year. We were able to obtain a foreign male DNA profile on some evidence, and we put the DNA profile in the CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System, and at that time, we obtained no hits. That's when the department turned to advanced genetic genealogy testing. It is not known if Kim and Johnny knew each other. Twenty-two-year-old Diana Hansen lived in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1983. She was a college student and was visiting her parents while on holiday break. At 4.30 p.m. on December 30th, she left her family's home to go on her daily jog. When she did not return, her parents got concerned and called the police. The next day, a construction worker stumbled upon a body in a desert area on West Spring Mountain Road. The body was quickly identified as Diana. The autopsy revealed that she had been indecently assaulted. Detectives were able to recover DNA from her body and preserved it for future use. Police also found signs of a struggle at the crime scene. They believed Diana had been abducted somewhere along her route and then driven to a second location. For the next 38 years, investigators from the Las Vegas Metro Police Department continued to work leads on the case. However, they were unable to identify a suspect. In August of 2021, investigators reached out to Ortham Inc a Texas-based forensic sequencing lab to request advanced genetic testing on a DNA sample taken from evidence left at the crime scene. After DNA testing was complete, they identified Johnny Blake Peterson is responsible for taking Diana's life. Dr. David Mattelman, the CEO of Ortham Inc. had this to say, We took this profile and did a number of things, including a genealogical search that allowed us to identify ever so distant relatives. And with a lot of distant relatives, we were able to piece back together through the public records and family trees a plausible identity for who the donor of the DNA was. As Johnny is responsible for what happened to both Diana and Kim, investigators are looking into the possibility that he has more victims. They already have a list of five similar cases that they believe he could be involved in. 19-year-old Pamela Dorrington lived in Helena, Montana in 1968. She graduated from Helena High School and was working as a surgical tech at St. Peter's Hospital. Pamela was described as quiet, but popular with plenty of friends. She loved animals, including her dog and horse, and was interested in languages with the hope of studying to become an interpreter. Pamela was last seen on the evening of February 16, 1968, at a restaurant in Helena. The next day, she was reporting missing when her friends and family could not reach her. For months, law enforcement officers, family, and friends looked for her, with flyers of her put up across the northwest region of the country. About four months after Pamela was last seen on June 13, 1968, the custodian of the Gates of the Mountains Marina found human remains floating near the dock. After some testing, it was confirmed that the remains belonged to Pamela Dorrington. The man that lived in the apartment below Pamela was questioned by investigators, as he was acting strange but there was not enough evidence against him, so the case went cold. In December of 2021, 79-year-old Courtney Brooke Atlas confessed to taking Pamela's life. He was the man that lived in the apartment below Pamela. According to him, on the morning of February 17, 1968, he called Pamela and said that there was a water leak in her apartment that needed to be fixed. He then entered her apartment and strangled her. Courtney then stored her body in a barrel at a hangar where he taught flying lessons. Eventually, he moved her body and disposed of the remains by tossing them off the York Bridge, where it was discovered by the custodian. Courtney is already serving a life sentence for taking his wife's life in 1983 and then burning their home down with his wife's body inside. Courtney demanded immunity from prosecution for what he did to Pamela, and then he'll tell them everything. It was discussed with Pamela's family, and then the offer was accepted. It's not really known, though, why Courtney decided to confess after all these years. Pamela's brother Jeff had this to say, 
It's very emotional, of course, but it's been a relief and there is a certain amount of closure. I've been thinking about Pam every day for 53 years, and it's so hard to abruptly stop. But I woke up this morning and went, it's a new day, things are different. It's great, I must say, that the confession was given, and now we know what happened and how it happened, noted Jeff Dorrington. It is closure. Sonia Carmen Harrockstone was a 30-year-old single mother living with her four-year-old daughter in Monterey County, California in 1981. She was a merchandiser and sales representative for Levi Strauss & Company. On October 15, 1981, a friend of Sonia, Colleen McBride, knocked on her front door. When Sonia didn't answer, McBride made her way inside. It was then that she found Sonia's partially clothed body sprawled on the floor of her living room. She had been strangled with a pair of pantyhose. Several pieces of DNA evidence were collected from the crime scene to be used later. Investigators decided to make a timeline of the crime. They believed her life was taken while her young daughter was at school. It was around noon when her body was found. Soon after the crime took place, a man told investigators that he has a friend who admitted to being inside Sonia's house the morning her life was taken. The friend is Michael Glazebrook, Sonia's neighbor. A day after the crime occurred, investigators decided to interview Michael. They saw that he had a scratch on his face and was extremely nervous. On December 18, 1981, he was arrested in connection to the case. In 1983, he was tried, but the jury could not agree on his innocence or guilt. Prosecutors dropped the case following a mistrial. In the early 1980s, DNA evidence was a long way off. Blood was found under Sonia's fingernails, but lab technicians could only tell that it did not belong to her. In 2020, investigators decided to re-examine the case. They tested the DNA evidence they had collected back in 1981 again. They were then able to create a DNA profile. Because they still believed Michael Glazebrook was involved, they collected his DNA sample. After some more testing, it was confirmed that Michael is responsible for taking the life of Sonia. 65-year-old Michael was arrested at his home in Seaside, California in August of 2021. He worked as a school bus driver, which is just terrifying. Michael now finds himself in the Monterey County Jail, where he is being held in lieu of bail, set at $1 million. Twenty-five-year-old Kathy Warnett Hicks lived in Atlanta, Georgia in 1982. She was an employee for Delta Airlines. In September, Kathy was visiting Hawaii to participate in a company softball tournament. She was staying at the Iwikai Hotel. Kathy was last seen by her co-workers on September 19th at 1.30 a.m. She was seen with a man named Tommy. According to the co-workers, Kathy and Tommy rode an elevator from the 24th floor to the hotel lobby. The pair then went toward the pool area while her friends went to a nearby club. A little later in the day, at 10 a.m., two joggers found a woman's body when they stopped by the water reserve not far from the hotel. She was quickly identified as Kathy Hicks. She had been strangled. Investigators from the Honolulu Police Department started investigating the case. DNA was found on Kathy's underwear that belonged to a male. The DNA was stored so it could be used later when DNA was more advanced. A sketch was made of the man witnesses saw Kathy with last. A co-worker of Kathy also told investigators that the man said he was a Navy sailor and had been in Hawaii for about two years and that he was a native of Tuskegee, Alabama and lived in Jacksonville, Florida before moving to Hawaii. No witnesses to the crime came forward and police did not find any other useful leads so the case went cold. Then in 2019, the solving of an entirely different cold case would lead to the suspect in Kathy's case. Investigators tested DNA found at the crime scene of Pamela Cahanes and found that 61-year-old Thomas Lewis Garner is responsible for taking her life. Thereafter, in 2021, they found that his DNA also matched the DNA found on Kathy Hicks's underwear. Thomas worked as a dental hygienist in Jacksonville, Florida. He was also a veteran. In June of 2021, he was given a life sentence for what he did to Pamela, and investigators are sure he'll soon be convicted for taking Kathy's life. Attorney Megan Cowell said that it is vital that he should be prosecuted even though he was already sentenced to life in prison. It's justice for the victim and the victim's family. Bringing a prosecution on behalf of the victim's family 
often makes you feel like justice has prevailed. Let's say, for example, the Florida Supreme Court overrules the conviction for some reason and dismisses the case. Now, if the government doesn't bring the case against the same suspect, the suspect will be let out into the community and could and probably would reoffend. DNA is extremely helpful because we can rely on the science. So now we can identify the perpetrator, we can prosecute the perpetrator, and hopefully convict the perpetrator. I'm sure many of you also now want to hear more about the Pamela Haynes case. So here it is in a nutshell. Pamela grew up in Stillwater, Minnesota. In 1984, 25-year-old Pamela enlisted in the Navy. In May of that year, she left behind her family and flew across the country to Orlando, Florida to begin training at the Orlando Naval Training Center. Sadly, Pamela never had the chance to see her dreams come true. Two days after her graduation in August 1984, her lifeless body was discovered in front of a vacant home in Sanford, Florida. She had been assaulted and strangled. Investigators were able to collect DNA belonging to an unknown man from her body. In 2000 and 2005, investigators unsuccessfully attempted to find a DNA match to Pamela's attacker. In 2015, investigators finally got a break. DNA from Pamela's clothing was submitted to a private forensic genealogy service. Investigators were able to access DNA profiles of individuals who submitted their DNA to genealogy websites. They found a match to a distant relative of Pamela's attacker. Investigators began to build a family tree that would eventually lead them to Thomas Garner, as we already know. Investigators had to make sure they had the right guy, so they then collected a cigarette that he had smoked. The samples matched the DNA found on skin collected from underneath Pamela's fingernails. Her surviving family members were very happy to hear the great news when investigators told them that he was arrested and also when he was convicted. 